Two households, both alike, in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventure piteous overthrows, doth with their death bury their parents' strife. you, patient years attend, but he shall miss. Our toil shall strive to win. Wonderful. Was it good? I'll be with you, Sam. Sam, it's not my fault. Most of Shakespeare could do it yesterday. Do me a speech. Do me a line. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Another little problem. What do we do now? The show must, you know. Go on. Juliet does not come on for 20 pages. It will be all right. How will it? I don't know. It's a mystery. transforms um, this into an excellent experience for us. <laughs> so welcome, I'm Steve Mattel, the Director for Sustainability here at the University of Oregon. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to see so many familiar faces, and also I want to say I'm thrilled uh, to see so many new people who've chosen to join us here for the ISCN conference this year. Uh, ISCN is uh, purposely an intimate conference. Uh, we don't seek to um, uh, get our, grow our numbers to several hundred or thousands uh, because we know it's about both content uh, and connections. We have excellent speakers, neat venues, and good food to share, um, but the success of the conference will be determined by the extent to which you're inspired to engage with each other and take new risks when you return next week to your home institutions. Uh, a brief word about our theme this year, it's Power of Partnerships. The sustainability movement crept onto um, our campuses in the form of recycling programs, green buildings, and lighting retrofits. Um, it's expanded, of course, to include new majors, co-curricular programming, and research centers now. Uh, now we observe institutions forging new partnerships with local governments, corporations, and other institu institutions, just to name a few. During the conference, we'll peek at what's next in campus sustainability by exploring some of these innovative uh, partnerships. Let me um, take a moment to introduce a few um, key people around here. Stephen Ames, maybe he would stand up wherever he is, unless he's left the room. <laughs> well, I'll have to get to that later. Um, Shelly Bowerman is the other person. Is she here? Those are the two key staff who I wanted to point out to you all. So, uh, in the event that I feel entirely left alone and I'm wondering what to do, I have somebody to help me. They are here. They're probably dealing with last minute. Um, If you have you know, questions, concerns, problems, needs, feel free to ask either one of us. Fern Casemir will introduce his staff, and um, they're also here to help. And we'll introduce them in just a minute. I also want to um, take a moment to thank the city of Eugene and King Estate Winery. Both of them provided um, uh, both financial and in-kind support for the conference. It wouldn't have happened without their support. Um, OK, a few logistical things. Uh, several of you have um, sent us um, your case studies, and so I encourage those of you, uh, well, I encourage people to download those off of the ISCN website, take a look at them. It's a uh, nice fodder for meeting and talking to people later on over drinks this evening. Um, I'll be sending an email. I hope people are, are checking their emails today and tomorrow. I'll be sending an email later today with a few logistical notes for tomorrow. Instead of taking up time now, you'll just get an email, take a look at it before you go to bed tonight. Simple things will be included in that, so please check that. Uh, officially, um, there is no food or drink allowed in this room, and so we will do our our best to police you. But the less that you, uh, that, just please help us out with that. There's a that causes difficulties around here. So, I mean, things like that. Um, I also want to say that I, I had the privilege to attend the Salzburg Global Seminar a few years ago. How many hands? How many people have been to the Schloss? One or 
or two. Well, uh, it seemed to me when I was there that there's many relationships were forged over the ping pong table that they keep down there in the basement of the Schloss. Um, so we're replicating it here. Shelly Dedman, who should be in the room. Shelly, would you stand up? Uh, she organized our, the first ISCN, the very first uh, battle for the paddle. <laughs> um, so there's two ping pong tables available for your use. Shelly, would you tell us where the sign up sheet is? Sign up is uh, right outside this door to the left. It's a little post it note that's folded there. You can just sign up. We're hoping that it would be uh, very self organizing. So if you're the second person to a pair, uh, go ahead and send them a quick email and um, arrange a time to play. We know there's not a whole lot of time, but hoping that you would make time and perhaps forge a new partnership over the ping pong table. So, and what are the hours? Um, the whole time, I mean, any time, an hour before events start in the morning to an hour after they're over. So. Anytime you can squeeze a game in, I'll be over there and loiter around. We're, we're great to see you all. Uh, let me say just a word about participation this year. We're slightly over 100 people, which is a, a small bump from past conferences. As of June 4th, we had 19 countries. I think it's actually over 20 now, across five continents, 55 organizations. And I just want to personally thank each and every one of you for um, taking the time out of your very busy schedules to be here with us um, today. So let me get on to um, uh, uh, introducing some other key people who will um, welcome you to our city and our campus. Uh, Jamie Moffitt is first. Jamie Moffitt um, has been the UVO, at UVO for the past decade. Recently, she was promoted to Vice President for Finance and Administration um, and is our CFO here at the University of Oregon. Jamie has degrees from Harvard and Tufts. Before coming to UVO, she was also a senior executive at a venture-backed uh, technology company in Boston and a consultant um, prior to that with McKinsey and Company. Um, on the fun side, Jamie also spent time on the women's professional tennis circuit, which is a, a fun fact you might want to ask her about later um, at King State or elsewhere. So Jamie, would you please come on up? Recycling programs that are meeting the edge, uh, to clean rivers, um, just tons of things going on with um, new product design, green product design. Um, it's really part of the identity uh, of, of the area, and I'm hoping that you'll get a flavor for that and a feel for that uh, as you're visiting here. Um, I will share with you, I usually try to avoid telling embarrassing stories in front of large groups, but uh, I'm going to break that rule. Uh, and share with you just a, a quick snippet. Um, as Steve said, I, I, I moved out here. I've been with the university about just under 10 years, moved from the East Coast, and there were some very significant cultural changes when I went from Boston uh, to Eugene. Uh, many I won't share. Um, one of the more embarrassing ones was, this was over a decade ago, and I walked into my first, uh, I think it was the Lane County Fair, or the State Fair, and I had my lunch, and I walked over to where I thought I was plopping it in the trash, and I saw all the different recycling containers, and I had no idea what I was doing. And I was very nervous about putting things in the wrong place uh, and having people get very upset with me. Um, I, I'm pleased to say that I'm now adept at putting things in the correct place, and, and, and I'm good at that uh, aspect. But it was definitely a cultural change. It was something that I, I really haven't seen before, coming from the East Coast over a decade ago. Um, as I said, we're really thrilled that you're here. Uh, we hope that you have uh, an opportunity to um, visit with our campus, see our campus. We're looking forward to sharing the collective wisdom of this group and sharing stories and experiences. Um, I am going to move along with the program, but I just wanted to take a minute to um, recognize Mayor Kitty Piercy and the city of Eugene. Uh, the mayor's here with us. They've been tremendous partners in a number of things that we do, and particularly along sustainability and green leadership. And we're really looking forward to um, continuing that partnership and having opportunities to collaborate together going forward. So thank you so much for, for the support uh, for this event and for others. Um, I think you have a list we gave out, a handout that shares with you uh, many of the things that we're trying to do, many of the commitments that we've made uh, along the lines of sustainability, and we've done that across uh, our academic programs, our operational programs, um, our partnerships with other groups. 
Um, I'm happy to share with you that I have um, one more commitment to add to that list, which is uh, last week our interim president uh, did sign the ICN charter, so we're happy to officially have that signed charter, and uh, I'm going to pass that off to the ICN secretary. Uh, so She's done an enormous amount to advance the local sustainability agenda, um, some of which you'll highlight in her welcoming remarks. In 2010, um, I'll say a few things, at least one thing that I'm sure she won't um, mention. In 2010, she was recognized as the, quote, most valuable local, local elected official by The Nation magazine. We're very proud of that. If you want to know more about Kitty, you can check out her web Wikipedia entry. How many people have one of those? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage, Mayor Kitty. Well, one of the things about Wikipedia, in case you, I don't know, you're probably all familiar, but you know that anybody can put anything on it at any time, and if you don't keep up with it, it can have all kinds of things that you hadn't actually planned on being there and don't see that it's actually very accurate. So it's an interesting thing. Um, I'm just here today to um, thank you, Steve, and everybody who's been involved in this, to welcome each and every one of you to Eugene, Oregon. We certainly hope this is a wonderful stay for you, that you enjoy being here and feel very welcome here. I understand that the focus of your symposium is on the importance of expanding sustainability initiatives beyond campus boundaries and forming partnerships with local governments and organizations. In that case, I can't think of a better place than Eugene for this conference. The city of Eugene prides itself on its partnerships, and truly, of course, as we've been all talking about, one of our most important community partners is our own University of Oregon. There are approximately 25,000 students who live, study, work, and volunteer here, and we benefit every day in terms of our local economy, the many cultural opportunities the University of Oregon provides, and from the amazing contributions students make to, it, to our community in sharing their skills and talents. We also have a lot to offer, especially when it comes to expanding sustainability efforts. Eugene has been a nationally recognized leader in the area of the environment for a number of years. We've been rated the greenest city in the United States by National Geographic. The International Olympic Committee gave its first ever award for sports and the environment to Eugene's 2008 U.S. Olympic tra team trials. And we are actually going to try to beat that this year. So you're here right at the time of the Olympic track and field trials. Eugene was named top city for green scenes where capitalism meets eco-consciousness by Entrepreneur Magazine. We're proud of these recognitions. I have a lot of other things I'm going to say here that are written in front of me, but I want to say something to you. When I became mayor, and Eugene has this great reputation for being so, and, and we have done a lot of really good environmental work and had some wonderful city employees who've moved the dial for us over the years. But when I became mayor in, um, in 2005, we were still in Eugene, Oregon, having a big fight over whether you could be pro-environment and pro-business at the same time. And people kind of got themselves on sides. And so uh, I listened to people. Actually, I had friends. And I'm a very liberal person. And I had some friends when I was running for office who said to me, now, whatever you do while you're running for mayor, don't mention the word sustainability. <laughs> People will think you're some kind of eco-freak and you'll never get elected. And as I knocked on doors and listened to people, I felt that left, right, and all points in between in our political spectrum, people were ready to do more, not less. People were ready to step it up. And um, so um, one of the things that mattered to me, and I don't know how you're approaching that in your conversation here, 
that our city has, we really try to pay attention to the triple bottom line. So yes, we care about protecting our environment now and for future generations. Yes, we care about having a strong economy where people can raise their kids and families. And we also care about social equity. And those things are some, sometimes when people talk about sustainability, they don't talk about all of those things. They talk about part of those things. And so um, part of our work as a city has been to try to develop a, what we call the TBL, the triple bottom line tool, that when we're making decisions for our city, no matter in what capacity, not just within sort of the silo of traditional environmental work, but that in every decision that we make, we will try to see how that decision affects all points, all three parts of the triple bottom line, and use that to try to guide us in making our decisions. So that's very important to me personally. In 2007, we established a sustainability commission that works to create a healthy community now and in the future by proposing measurable solutions to pressing environmental, social, and economic concerns to the city of Eugene, its partners, and its people. In 2010, Eugene completed an award-winning community climate and energy action plan. Now we are actively integrating those actions into local land use and transportation plans. And we have a host of city programs and services that support our community sustainability efforts, including the Office of Sustainability, <clears throat> a waste prevention and green building program, community gardens, composting, and urban agriculture programs, and I might say an urban forest as well. We have electric vehicle charging stations in our parking garages and community centers, a shared car program in our downtown and at the university, uh, the Mayor's Bold Step Awards, where we uh, award businesses for taking steps in the right direction. And I added some to the list that says that um, <clears throat> some things that we have, like in our Public Works Department, they discovered that they used a warm mix instead of a hot mix for road surface that saved a lot of energy and made a real difference. So. Um, uh, in our parks program, they move from idling trucks to do their work in the park to creating their own bicycle-driven vehicles to do the work in our parks. So uh, in every department, I'm proud to say um, and, um, and admire the efforts of our staff to try to take, make differences everywhere they go. We look at how things affect the health of people. We look at the equity of services, housing, and we try to. We are trying hard to uh, become a human rights city. We frame everything within the human rights context. We're interested in better wages and jobs because that makes a lot of difference for everybody. So, as you see, I could go on, but I invite you to learn by, more by yourself. Visit our parks and pools, our offices and libraries. Take a look at the new Lee Platinum Lane Community College building in our downtown that will demonstrate and teach about sustainable building strategies. Ride the MX, our bus rapid transit system that utilizes hybrid vehicles. We're very excited to have you here. We look forward to sharing and learning from you. When we were approached by Steve for support of this conference, we jumped at the chance to bring you here to Eugene to experience our quality of life and for us to learn from you as well. We continue to work with the University of Oregon on a wide variety of partnerships, some of which I touched on today, and you will learn through the rest of the program. Thank you so much for making the trip to our city. I welcome you and hope that you have a great time. Thank you. Casimira is the ISCN program manager, and he'll introduce the ISCN team um, and some background information about ISCN, and then we'll get started with our keynote speaker. So, Bern, please, uh, please welcome Bern to the stage. So, welcome from the ISCN. We are delighted you're here. Um, I quickly want to introduce my colleagues, uh, Matt and Claire, who are at the back. So, if you have any questions about um, IICN matters, please ask them. My colleague Deborah Shetlert, who many of you has, have been in contact with about the charter, is stuck in San Francisco. She should be here tonight. You know. <coughs> so, um, 
we started out, as most of you know, with uh, conferences in Switzerland, went on to Shanghai, actually Arian was one of the proposers of this conference, that was a pretty big success and great fun. Went to Gothenburg, Sweden, we've got the Swedish team here, and four, so four people are very happy about that. And now this is the first ICN meeting in the US, so very happy and very grateful to see for, for hosting that. Um, we already have set up the next two meetings. We're going to be in Singapore next year and the year after at Harvard. And we would very much hope that most of you can come again. This meeting should be a great continuation of what we talk about in the next few days. Very quickly, because I don't want to uh, delay the course presentation, um, most of you will know that the ICN has these four key core elements. We've got the conferences and symposia every year, usually in summer. Uh, we've got the Campus Sustainability Excellence Awards, which will be presented tomorrow night for the current round. And we've got the working groups, the three working groups, and the ICN Gulf Sustainable Campus Charter, which has three principles, which again are in the face of the working groups. And it's important for me to say that all these elements are coming together next two days. And I want to thank the people, whoops, if I can. <laughs> so technology is not my problem. <laughs> I want to thank everybody uh, for making this happen. I want to thank all of you for being here. It's wonderful to see you. Um, I want to thank Steve and his team for hosting this meeting. They've been ex incredibly active the last six months, and uh, you're going to see the fruits of that. Um, we want to thank the applicants for the awards, which are going to be handed out tomorrow night by Matt. Um, the working groups and co-chairs, who did a lot of work in preparing the small group discussions, which are a hallmark of our conferences. We want this meetings not to be download presentations so much, but very much discussions between all of you, in-depth discussions about your experience. And last but not least, we want to uh, thank the ISC members, that's the charter signatories, for their leadership in common sustainability, and again, the University of Oregon as the latest charter member. Welcome to the club. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Orr is the Paul Sears Distinguished Professor of Environmental Studies uh, and Politics and a Special Assistant to the President of Oberlin College. He is the recipient of many honorary degrees and other awards. The one that I decided to pull out was the Lindhurst Prize, which acknowledges quote, persons of exceptional moral character, vision, and energy. Uh, Dr. Orr is a true pioneer of the campus sustainability movement. In 1987, he organized studies of energy, water, and material use on several college campuses that uh, helped to launch the Green Campus Movement that we uh, find ourselves enmeshed in today. His very first book, which was published in 1992, was called Ecological Literacy, which was described as a true classic by Garrett Hardin. In 96, he organized an effort to design the first sustainability green building on a US college campus. Um, and uh, many of us have, have followed suit, including this building here at the University of Oregon. Um, uh, in an influential article in the Chronicle of Higher Education in 2000, Dr. Orr, proposed the goal of carbon neutrality for colleges and universities, and subsequently organized and funded an effort to define a carbon neutral plan for his own campus. By 2008, hundreds of colleges and universities in the states and beyond, including Oberlin and the University of Oregon, I might add, and lots of the universities represented here today, have also made that pledge. Uh, now he's leveraging the power of partnerships with a bold new initiative that extends far beyond the campus border. As executive director of the Oberlin Project, Dr. Orr is focused on making the city of Oberlin a model of full spectrum sustainability and replicating that effort through a national sustainability communities coalition. Please welcome Dr. Orr. Thank you. I have to uh, stand over here to see the screen. Unless, can I slide this this way, Ben? Great. Okay. 
Well, it's nice to be here uh, in Bern. Thanks to you and your staff for uh, helping put this together. And Steve, uh, uh, for your hospitality. <laughs> what Steve didn't tell you was that, uh, like all of you, uh, I'm overwhelmed by email. And uh, when it comes in a particularly busy day, Steve had been asking whether I was going to be here or not. And I somehow just didn't rise to my uh, conscious. So he, he uh, sent a picture of him on his, what, hands and knees or begging <laughs> at a church or something like that, asking for divine intervention. And uh, so here I am. Uh, but Steve, thanks for your persistence and thanks for your hospitality and organizing all this. And thanks to all of you. What, what I'm going to describe uh, today is a composite of what you're already doing. And I want to describe this. I want to go back to about 35,000 feet. And if you read Nature magazine, which is, uh, along with science, probably the outstanding uh, science publication uh, in the world, June 7th, uh, the lead report was, it was titled, Approaching a State Shift in Earth's Biosphere. <laughs> you know, now that's about as dull a way as you could ever say, hey, the end is coming. Uh, <laughs> fasten your seatbelts or what, whatever. But if you read between the lines, this is science speak, but it was an incredibly important article. And as you know, the warnings about uh, the state of the biosphere, but read this. It's uh, June 7th, Nature magazine. Uh, uh, the warnings go way, way back, and we've been uh, deaf to most of them. Uh, in 1976, I worked uh, as kind of a minor person in Jimmy Carter's transition team. And at that time, we warned Carter of climate change and the energy issue. He came into the office one day and said, what's the biggest issue I'm going to face environmentally? And, and our answer was, well, it's, it's going to be environment, uh, probably energy, uh, and that ties to climate change. That was 1976. And we have no, in the United States, no de jure uh, climate policy. We have a de facto policy, which is still kind of pedal to the metal. Uh, we, uh, the first warning to a U.S. president on climate destabilization was given in 1965. And on this issue, we have been autistic. And I'm going to go through some of the, uh, what I think are some of the important issues about this. Uh, but the, this is the ball game. And time is not our friend. Personal story. Uh, in 2008, I was living in London. And I wrote a book called uh, uh, Down to the Wire, uh, Confronting Climate Collapse. And that was a meditation uh, of mine at 35,000 feet looking at this issue. And what's it mean for you and me to live in, in this world as we're effectively driving ourselves, if you're biblical about this, we're evicting ourselves from uh, the only paradise humans have ever known, and geologists call that the Holocene. We're now in what uh, has been labeled the Anthropocene, which is just a big fancy word to say that we're now in the driver's seat. Uh, at about 15,000 feet, uh, one of my side jobs is to work for a foundation, and several years ago we funded a climate action plan for the next U.S. president, be it Democrat or Republican. It didn't really, well, it matters, but you know, it was, uh, we were agnostic on the issue at the time. And so we pulled together about 250 climates, actually we're not agnostic, I'm lying. Uh, we pulled together about 250 climate scientists and policy people, and we worked for about a year on what John Podesta later said was the, the Cadillac or the gold standard of uh, climate policy thinking. Our focus was the first 100 days of the next administration. Uh, obviously, uh, those 100 days came and went. The Obama administration had other priorities, which uh, were, you know, uh, debatable. But for me, they were, uh, they were wrong. That the health of the planet, given the time that we have to act, was the critical priority, and it was not acted on. So a uh, personal decision. I have four grandkids, and the question for me is, okay, what do I do? And you're going to hear the story of, of what, what I think, uh, uh, well, the, the result of that. What do I do and what do you do? And, and you know, we're all kind of in this together. But uh, the story I'm going to tell you is a very personal uh, story. Uh, on the screen behind me is uh, a black swan. And uh, how many of you have read Nicholas Taleb's Black Swan book? Okay. Reading assignment, you've got to read The Black Swan. This is not the movie. This is, this is the, the book. Uh, Nicholas Taleb is a financial risk analyst, and uh, uh, the book, and I'll explain a little bit about this in just a moment, but the book is a, uh, in particular, the paperback version, because he's got an afterword that is particularly useful in thinking about uh, these kind of events. But all swans are white until one's black. And that is an unpredictable event. And so that's the, the background, but it also fits with the article in, in Nature magazine, Tipping Points. That we're at a point where uh, we know big changes are underway, 
they are in almost every case adverse to our habitability, the habitability of the planet. So um, let me uh, proceed. This is a Gaussian curve, and uh, the risks which are uh, that we focus on for the most part are under the large part of this. So the risks here are 99 percent. The risks occur here. What Taleb's point is that the, this long tail here uh, to the right is where the big risks are going to occur. And those are unknown probabilities. We really don't know what the probabilities are, we, but we know they're, they're greater than zero. And they have long lives, and they're global in impact. So black swan events uh, are typically the kind of things in, uh, you'll see just in, in a moment. What Taleb says is, and, and, and this is from the uh, afterword of the book, Mother Nature uh, likes redundancies, but nothing too big. Mother Nature would never make a, a Walmart or an Exxon Mobil corporation. Uh, uh, but not anything too big or too connected. And you think of globalization. And think back a few years, if you remember uh, Barron's Bank uh, in Hong Kong was collapsed by a trader with too much on margin, and he collapsed a bank that had a history of around 250 years. One person, black swan events. Uh, and the people that collapsed, nearly collapsed the global economy in 2008, the quants, you, you could put them in a room this size. The people that nearly collapsed the global economy. Uh, and then finally, uh, the upshot is designing a society that is robust to error. I like that phrase. The word resilience is in common use uh, now, and I want to come back and, and uh, think a little bit with you about what that means and what we do as, as uh, drivers of that process. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide. You, you get all this. There, there are the big drivers and so forth, and there are the, the multiplier effects, and you, you all study this and so forth. But we live in a world that's a very different kind of world now than the world 100 years ago or even 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. It's a world now where small changes can have big effects and they can be global, these black swan events. And then this is a, uh, uh, again, I'll skip over this, but you, you get the point that the things that are fast and catch our attention. I know a whole lot more about a lot of really bizarre celebrities than I need to know. And so in the meantime, the biggest issues that humans have ever faced, climate change and so forth, and all that relates thereunto, uh, those changes are uh, underway, but they typically are slow until they reach those kind of tipping points described in the Nature article. And so they, they you know, it's, everything is okay, it's okay, it's okay, till it's not okay. I mean, it's a, it's a high wire act. Um, but our attention is all wrong, uh, the public attention. This was thought to be the slave, safest oil platform uh, in use until it wasn't. This is, of course, uh, the Fukushima event, and you have a, a uh, connection between a seismic event, bad planning, probably some political corruption, and equipment made by General Electric. And the rest is kind of history. And the ripple effects from Fukushima will, will go on for uh, many years. Uh, this bridge was thought to be, it was inspected about a month before it collapsed. This bridge was thought to be safe until it wasn't. Um, and uh, black swan events are not simply, not only technological accidents, there are things like uh, food prices. And so the food prices begin to go up. This is an FAO uh, chart of food prices. And then a black swan event, uh, the Cairo Spring. And so there, there are lots of ways in which these things begin to converge. And the, the food prices were in part related to famine or the heat wave in Russia two years before, uh, grain prices globally, uh, pesticides and so forth, or pests, and uh, grain production. And so things begin to converge, and the result is uh, uh, catastrophic. I just had to put this in. <laughs> this is uh, a Time Magazine, 1999. And Time selected these three folks as the saviors of the global economy. Uh, and they did an amazing job of it. Uh, and uh, the guy in the front, uh, Alan Greenspan, uh, noted that he had discovered a flaw. He was, if you, if you follow economic discourse, he was a student of Ayn Rand's uh, and a devotee of Ayn Rand's. But he had discovered a flaw in his economic thinking. Now, the point of this is that black swan events that we have to reckon with, this large issue of sustainability, has a lot to do also with how we think about organizing the economy. And the problem, of course, with the, the, the flaw that he didn't reckon with is that uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how 
the laws of economics, which begin in 1776 with the publication of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, can be calibrated with the laws of the planet. They're about, what, 3.8 billion years old. So how do you make that calibration, these, these laws that we take to be economic laws, the market? And they don't fit easily or in any really obvious way. This, this is going to be a tough calibration to figure out how we provision ourselves with food, energy, water, shelter, materials, and all those things that, that make life possible for humans with the way the earth works as a physical system. That's the challenge for our generation. And we've got to go, as all of you know, from something like in the United States, 22 tons of carbon emitted per person down to two. And that's, that is a huge transition that we haven't uh, been serious about yet. Anyway, uh, these are simply the numbers. And th there's a problem th that we have as humans, and all of you face this in all of your work. Uh, I can take that article, and I can tell you that uh, scientists, reputable scientists in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, probably the uh, most prominent science journal in the world, uh, say that we're coming up on tipping points. And nobody in this room has sweaty palms because I said that. That's not, that's not what moves us. Uh, on the screen behind me is simply is, uh, the carbon and temperature record, and that doesn't move anybody either. You're looking at that, you're wired to look at that, and you're wired to say, well, gee, if you just change the color blue a little bit, and you know, maybe the red should be orange and so forth. We're wired to see that as a physical, not as a, well, just as a physical thing, not as a reality. But I've said to audiences uh, all over the country that if I reach back here and I pull out a, you know, a, an Uzi and I kind of casually walk out in the audience, I'll get your attention in a way that that doesn't get it and this doesn't get it. You follow what I'm saying? This is the problem we have that this just doesn't register with us. And that doesn't register either. But direct physical threats, they get our attention because what happens is your adrenal system kicks in, your fight flight mechanism kicks in, and we are very good at dealing with uh, dependably loathsome kind of threats. If it's fast and hairy with long teeth, we're good. Yeah, we are, we're good at organizing for those kind of events, but not for these. To say parts per billion, and we're now at uh, uh, several weeks ago, 400 parts per million were recorded over the Arctic. And remember, the background number was 280. And it isn't just the rate, it's the rate of increase, which is now compressed into not uh, millennia, but into decades. But we're not wired to see this. Um, but you've all, I mean, th this is kind of the challenge I think that we face. The, this is the warming. Uh, the metric down here needn't uh, detain us, but this is the metric over here. This is the warming rate in various states. Uh, yesterday in Colorado, I was told it was 92 with 3% uh, humidity. Uh, near Fort Collins, and so the, the uh, wildfires are breaking out. Um, this is the shift in uh, climate risk, again, this Gaussian curve. What this means is that this long tail over here will be more extremes, and then where you hit various kind of tipping points, you know, who knows? This is now Russian roulette. This is the one-time experiment, as Roger Ravel said, that we should not be running with the planet. You all know that. These are U.S. Uh, uh, climate change or climate change related disasters rising. Those are the numbers worldwide uh, in a different form. Uh, that's last year's rainfall records in Ohio, where I'm from. Uh, last year, we set the state record for rainfall, not by one or two percent, but by nearly 25 percent, 11 inches. And we've never seen that much rain before. Uh, this was an event uh, several years ago in Tennessee, everything in red. Uh, here is a thousand year probability. This is uh, Thailand last year, Pakistan a year before, tornadoes. This is Yasi 2011, the largest cyclonic event at that time to hit Australia. Uh, the Russian heat wave 2010, and this is where it appears on that Gaussian curve. It's way out here. So this long tail that uh, Nicholas Taleb is describing. That is its global effects. This affected uh, grain prices. Uh, it's actually still affecting grain prices this year. But the effect was uh, several years of higher prices for grain because of the Russian market. Uh, drought in the Sahel and other places. This is a chart taken several uh, weeks ago. This is sea ice decline so far this year. It's outpacing the decline in every other previous year. And so the air conditioning system for the planet is breaking down. Uh, this is a one meter sea level rise, which is almost assured sometime around mid-century in the United States. This is a three meter sea level rise. 
likely uh, sometime uh, probably after the year 2100. Now what that means is that we're going to have to move a lot of people back from the coast. That's going to be a political issue. I want to come back to that at the end. One meter in Florida looks like this. Three meters looks like that. One meter east coast USA uh, looks like that. Six meters looks like that. But for every one of the countries that you represent, you could do the same kind of maps. They all exist. And so uh, the huge percentage of humans that live on coastal areas will have to retreat. And we're, 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 it's hard to get this uh, through to people. Uh, several years ago at the University of Michigan, uh, several of us were talking about climate change relative to architectural design. Right after our talk, uh, a firm designing airports in Asia on basically low-lying areas that are one to no more than two meters above sea level presented all these new and glitzy airports that are being planned. And you want to say, did you hear what the forecast is? You'll have to dike all of those areas. Those are not viable places to build. So uh, it's hard to get the message through. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, just was saying that resilience is kind of the, the big N-word now. And no one really knows what this, uh, what this means. It's like sustainability. They're, they're linked. There'll be no sustainable society that uh, is not also resilient. But what this means exactly, uh, we don't yet know. There's been no human society. It doesn't mean that things are frozen. It means that the changes have to be uh, calibrated with uh, lots of other sorts of things. But humans have, uh, at a advanced level of technology never achieves sustainability or resilience. And we don't know yet what we'll be called on to do to make that. The default setting in the culture is that enough technology and we'll, we'll make it. Uh, we ought to be somewhat more skeptical about technology and what it does to us and what it does for us. Um, now, th this is the personal part of the story. This is where I, I live. This is Oberlin, Ohio. I'll show you where this is in just a moment. Uh, last year, uh, I showed this picture and I said you get pictures like this uh, by attaching a first year student at Oberlin College to a helium filled balloon <laughs> and give them a camera with electronic download. And I made some wise comment that uh, this was Bob, picture taken by Bob and we really miss him. Uh, said he didn't transfer, he just kind of drifted away. And the woman came up afterwards. I was just being funny, I thought. The woman came up afterwards and said, you know, you really shouldn't treat your students that way. <laughs> so anyway, I don't say that anymore. Uh, we are a very typical Ohio downtown. Uh, we are uh, a city with a poverty level of 28%. You'll see in just a moment that we are Rust Belt. Uh, Detroit's about 83 miles across Lake Erie. Cleveland's 35 miles to the east. Toledo, Ohio is about an hour to the west. Youngstown, close to where I grew up, is about an hour and 15 minutes uh, to the east. We're Rust Belt. And the poverty level is 28%. The number of students in the public schools on the free and reduced lunch costs is about 53%. So we're, we're not sustainable, we're not prosperous. So there's a kind of a layer of prosperity at the top, but there's a lot of problems down here. Um, what we did uh, was to begin a dialogue. Uh, I worked for the president of the college and what we, we began uh, in 2008, a dialogue about what we do relative to this. And, and the theory was very simple. Is you can't run a first class college in a fourth class and declining downtown. So th this means that as an anchor institution in the community, we're the big dog in a the community. There's a, a large air traffic control center, the largest actually in the United States, not located in, in an airport. So if you fly east to west, uh, any of the east coast cities from west coast cities, you pass through airspace controlled out of Oberlin, Ohio. But uh, you take the air traffic control center out, take Oberlin College out, and there's, there's not a whole lot there. There is some other industry and business. So the question is, how do we begin to lead in, in making sustainability relevant? And so uh, what we did, you know, we say, let's, let's uh, draw a circle from, uh, put a compass on the town square, draw a circle with roughly an eight or 10 mile radius. That's our focal point. And everything you've ever heard about sustainability happens in that circle. So it's bringing all the things that we do as advocates for this, this mysterious word called sustainability together in that eight mile or 10 mile radius. Uh, and we've gone about most of these things as a series of one-off things. So there was, we do renewable energy, and then we do sustainable agriculture, and then we do green education, and then we do green downtown stuff. Can we pull those together in a way that those parts actually reinforce the resilience and prosperity of the whole thing? So that, that's what we uh, set out to do. 
and we had uh, several organizing questions. The first at the top here is, can we build a prosperous, post-cheap fossil fuel economy in the heart of the Rust Belt and then begin to affect other, other places? Secondly, can you power a community by efficiency uh, and solar power? Now, as Americans, Americans are awful on this. Uh, we're the worst in the world on, on this issue. Uh, we're in the middle of an election campaign, and efficiency uh, is not part of the dialogue. Uh, but our attention goes to all the new gadgets that generate energy or, you know, spin or collect uh, uh, photons or whatever, but not reducing energy. And it has been uh, all along the cheapest, fastest, smartest thing to do. And uh, McKinsey Global says we can eliminate in the United States half of the energy that we now use at virtually no net cost. And yet it still doesn't register with us in a way that becomes national policy. Third goal was to begin to grow, uh, develop a green belt around the city and grow 70% of our food in that green belt. And that translates into uh, what we think is around 200 to 250 jobs in agriculture, food processing, marketing, and so forth. Fourth is to educate everybody for sustainability. And I'll say a word more about this in just a moment. But we think of education as happening in classrooms like this. Uh, or and or in institutions around which there's kind of a moat. I'm sure that's not true here. Because there's a lot of dialogue between the university and, and the city. But for the most part, educational institutions are pretty cloistered. Uh, there's kind of a moat drawn around, around them. And what happens uh, in London or Tokyo or Paris or Singapore is more important somehow than what happens a quarter inch outside uh, the campus. So the goal here is to begin to think about getting everybody involved in this. So our classroom is that 8 to 10 mile radius. That, that is what we're trying to do, and I'll come back and say a word about that in just a moment. And then the last item is what I've already said. We want to create a model, uh, and it goes by a variety of names. Call it what you will, but it is systems thinking applied to public policy and public administration. Uh, and the mayor described it, and a good bit of this is already happening here. It's happening wherever sustainability is breaking out. Uh, and you're finding that if you can begin to do things cooperatively and systemically and systematically, you save money, you create more efficiency in city services, you make people happier, you begin to take a lot of things out of the realm of uh, politics and just put them in the realm of common sense. Um, now, at the same time, there has been uh, an amazing design revolution in, in how we make the human presence on the earth. And the revolution is if you ask, can you power uh, a building or a community or uh, the planet by current sunshine and efficiency, the answer is, yeah, we, we know how to do that. That is no longer a technical issue. Can you make uh, factories that generate no or produce no waste? The answer is yes, that, that is technically now feasible. We have enough examples that that has gone past the realm of being theory or hype to being a reality. And so you get down the list on the screen and uh, this is the ecological design revolution. It's been mostly below the radar screen uh, in public attention. But it is a real remaking of human capability. So can we do sustainability? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, we can. Um, this is uh, uh, where I live. That's Lake Erie. And Detroit is um, uh, up here to the Northwest, that's Detroit here, Toledo, Youngstown over here, and Cleveland, Oberlin is, is right here. So we're firmly in the middle of that, uh, that Rust Belt region. Uh, this is our typical downtown. This is Ohio. Uh, the city was started by a bunch of people who, uh, well, they first organized a college. Oberlin was the first college to accept uh, African Americans uh, and women back in the 1830s in, the United, in U.S. history. Uh, and it became famous that that's been a commitment that has been maintained for a long time uh, since. Um, but very typical downtown. This, the Apollo Theater behind me, is a theater bought by uh, the college. It's now being refurbished as part of a green arts district, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. This is the, uh, the Adam Joseph Lewis Center. This was our experiment back in the, the 1990s to develop a platinum building before there was a U.S. Green Building Council rating system. And we organized uh, this effort uh, as an educational venture. And so we opened up the design process. We had 13 uh, public design charrettes or planning meetings. We simply said, if you want to be part of the design of a building, come on in. So we had about 250 uh, students and faculty and townspeople and folks as far away as uh, Pittsburgh and Columbus and Toledo come into the process. Uh, and it, those 13 charrettes were kind of interesting because we're not used to th thinking about uh, democracy 
and the built environment. The built environment is something that simply happens over there. And on your campuses, uh, it's likely that most decisions about how to build and what to build are taken, have been taken by uh, the planning office or the construction office at the university. So the first uh, charrettes were, uh, were long and awkward and, and we began to piece together the building and what, uh, what students wanted and so forth. And the standard for this project became to cause no ugliness, human or ecological, somewhere else or at some later time. And if that's the standard, then you think upstream from the building, whatever it looks like, you've got to go up to the wells and the mines and the forests and the manufacturing establishments where material flows start that are crystallized into the built form. And then you have to go downstream if it contributes to the toxification of the, the planet or to global warming or biotic impoverishment. You can't say that the building, if it violates human dignity and ecological integrity at either scale, is a good building. Very different kind of standard. And this wasn't all high-level stuff. And I've said uh, to audiences all over the country, we have a pond right behind me in, in this. And the, uh, uh, the administration did not want a pond beside the building. Their fear was that uh, students would skinny dip in the pond or there would be liability issues and so forth. So we took uh, their complaint to the next design charrette and the winning answer was, well, stock the pond with piranha. <laughs> and uh, so I sent a letter to the college attorney and said, we'll stock it with piranha. Is it okay we can build our pond? And his answer back was to say, okay, or you can, you can have your pond, but it's not because piranha deters, because they destroy the evidence on which lawsuits are based. <laughs> Uh, so, so we have a pond. Uh, this is an aerial of that, that same area. Uh, this is uh, the building itself. That's a PV array. This is a second array. This is our pond. Uh, this is a farm area back here, but, uh, and then this is a solar plaza that bounces sunlight into the building. What we tried to do in this uh, was to take the issues of sustainability and put them all within the context of a 13,700 square foot building. I remember this is 1995, 1996, and so forth. This is way back when. But the, the idea was to make this a laboratory in sustainability. Now, part of, the, part of the difficulty of understanding things like this, it's too big. It is too abstract. Great article, and I recommend reading it. But for most people, this and charts and PowerPoints doesn't register. Uh, so what we tried to do in this project was to downscale what we are talking about in terms of food and energy and building and landscape management and so forth down to an acre and a quarter size and then make that a laboratory for curriculum. And then you can begin to upscale that as all of you are involved in one way or another doing to the whole campus and then, and then making the whole community part of this. So this is the building. Uh, that's the back of it. That's part of the farm area. Uh, this is Bill McKibben uh, giving a talk on Earth Day. What Bill could not see, uh, I took this picture from an upstairs window looking down into the atrium. What he couldn't see was a bunch of students in the middle of a seven inch rain had uh, begun running around the back here uh, just past the glass uh, naked. And so they were out streaking and playing in the water and so forth, but uh, the audience down below didn't, didn't see that. Uh, our impact this is the rooftop array, and I didn't realize what an impact we'd had globally until uh, two years ago I was in Britain. It turns out that picture I took, the preceding picture of the PV array, shows up on the label of Harvey's beer. Uh, they took it off the internet or whatever, and so Harvey's beer uses my picture. So my people are talking to their people about uh, some kind of settlement. Um, we've got uh, five goals in the Oberlin Project. The first is to take a uh, 13 acre block, you'll see in just a moment, uh, that the college owns and turn that block into an economic driver. So as we develop that block, the idea is not to again have, have things closed off, but to have that block function as an economic driver in the local community, as a buyer of foods and wood products and uh, toiletries and artwork, anything that a, that a hotel and a block and so forth can, uh, can purchase. And then secondly, we want to get to carbon neutrality. Uh, we're one of 14 cities worldwide uh, selected by the Clinton Climate Initiative to be climate positive. We're obviously the little kid on the block. Oberlin's a city of 10,000. The, the big cities are Beijing and, and so forth. Our third goal is to develop a green belt around the, uh, the city that meets 70% of our, our local foods and resuscitate local agriculture. Now, Ohio was once a, a state that had a quarter of a million farms. We were a farm state 100 years ago. 
Uh, we're now down to about 65,000, mostly in the corn and soybean business, where protein is grown in Ohio, shipped to feedlots in the Midwest. So we want to change that. And then on education, uh, all of you and all of us have been involved in trying to break down silos within the campus between various kind of disciplines, get disciplines talking back and forth. It's the only way we can uh, make sense of the world in which we live. We're also interested in this project in breaking down the silos between institutions so that we begin to get a joint vocational school, which turns out that there had been no dialogue between the college and the, the joint vocational school, which uh, is an amazing facility uh, that trains kids going on to do lots of manual work and mechanics and other kinds of things, along with a two-year college, which turns out also to be an extraordinary uh, institution, and then the public schools and the college. So the question for us is how do you pull these four educational institutions together and widen the focus of what we begin to do? Can we begin to build a constituency uh, for sustainability? And then the last uh, item, and I'll say more about this right at the very end of the talk, uh, the last item is to begin to understand how we can replicate this. Uh, can we make this go viral, your work and my work and lots of other experiments? Because if we only work on our campuses, we're, we're gone for. Uh, we'll never make it. We don't have that kind of time. Uh, we've got to begin to have a, a much bigger impact, and eventually it's got to be global. So the Transition Town movement and the Oberlin Project and the work that all of you are engaged in has got to begin to aggregate to something that becomes a global force. And I think that's where we're headed. I think if you chart uh, the future of what you're doing and what we're doing and lots of other folks, you begin to see a, a real revolution uh, around the planet. So uh, those are our goals. Uh, we've organized the community around 11 teams. Uh, there are only seven on the screen because I couldn't figure out how to get 11 balls on this screen. Uh, but we've got community teams, about 300 people, uh, working in issues of food and energy, economic development, education, public policy, and so forth. So we've organized, we have a downtown office, we have a staff of four people. We just had a, um, a meeting with all the staff members and uh, all the people involved in the teams. We had about 125 people at a uh, re planning retreat. So what we've done is to start a dialogue uh, in a small Rust Belt city about the long-term future and how that relates to sustainability and resilience. Um, how many of you have read uh, Danella Meadows' piece, Leverage Points? Let me see your hand. About, about a third. If you Google uh, tonight, this is your second reading assignment, uh, Google uh, Dana Meadows' Leverage Points, and this article comes up. And, and the point of this is simply this. Um, what she did in this article, and Dana uh, was a wonderful faculty member at Dartmouth uh, who died prematurely uh, about a decade ago. What she did was to look at all the ways we try to change the world. So the things here at the very top, this gets the majority of our time and attention. We talk about subsidies and codes and standards and taxes and all this kind of stuff. But that's the least effective. It's necessary at some level, but that's the least effective way to change the world. The, the way, if, if you do change the world, what happens is down here, the goals of the system, mindset, worldviews, paradigms, and so forth. It's changing how people think. And so this gets your work and my work into the, the realm of pedagogy very quickly. And people are, what, what's interesting to me, people, we are, uh, we, we believe what we can see, touch, feel, experience. And the more abstract sustainability is, the less people are going to be interested, the less, the less they uh, understand about it. And so what she's saying here in lots of ways is you've got to change the paradigm and the belief system and the, and the world view of people. And how do you do that? Well, in Eugene, you're, you're doing it because the infrastructure is now becoming green. And you've got uh, different transit systems and different energy systems. And that's now becoming part of the, the sort of ho-hum default setting. That's just the way things are. But imagine a world where all the schools are designed to be solar powered, zero discharge, and the curriculum is a large part of the way the school is designed and built. And the kids are part of the design effort. All of a sudden, bingo. And what, what we've discovered in Oberlin, uh, we are, by the way, I ought to say this, we are, our reputation nationally is as a progressive uh, little left wing town, the People's Republic of Oberlin. Not so. Uh, we're a pretty typical Ohio town, about as conservative as any town uh, in Ohio, with a progressive college. And so they outnumber us, and the students can maybe sometimes be part of the process, sometimes not. And my hunch is it's probably the same with every college town. The institution is probably the radical 
core of uh, towns if there's there such a thing. Uh, but then the politics are pretty much driven by other kind of factors. So what we've learned is, and, and this is very interesting because we've got some people who are Tea Party members, right-wing people, or people who fancy themselves as right-wingers, who come along and get excited about a solar-powered school, but they don't want solar anywhere part of the national policy. And so I think two things happen. One is that the more tangible the goal, the less ideology. People are proud of having a school uh, that we're planning that will be among the best built in the United States. That's a source of local pride, and that's their kids, and that's their grandkids, and so that's easy to come to agreement on. And then if you ask people, what, do you, what kind of world do you want 50 years out? Do you want dirty air? No, you want clean air. Do you want uh, uh, safety? Yes. I don't want crime-ridden world. Do you want jobs and prosperity? Well, yes. So the further out you go in envisioning, the less ideology, and at the other extreme, the more practical the project, the less ideology. And we see this in meeting after meeting after meeting. And so in city council, which is a pretty conservative organization, we've, we've had uh, uh, so far only unanimous votes. You know, knock on wood. <laughs> this won't continue, I will, I will assure you. But anyway, uh, your second reading assignment is, is Google this article. And whether you agree with it or not, it, it's, a, it's a good way to begin to think about how we can be not just right, but right and effective and begin to change things around us. Uh, this is, uh, these are some of the buildings around the, the block. And I put this up here because uh, I want to make a point. This is the Allen Art Museum. This has, by the way, been, uh, this is at the corner of the Green Arts Block. And you'll see the map in just one second. This has been renovated at the LEED Gold level. Uh, this is a 1917 art museum. It's the third ranked art museum in American higher education. Very famous building. That's a Cass Gilbert building. This is a uh, LEED Gold Jazz building, uh, the only uh, lead rated jazz facility, I think, in the world. Uh, this is Hall Auditorium uh, Performing Arts Center, and this is the Science Building. Now, <clears throat> the point of putting this up here is this. Uh, people like us, and this is not a pejorative against any one of you, but people like you and me typically are boring people. We talk about science. We are wonky people, and we talk about tons of and parts per million. And you know what I'm saying? I don't mean this to be insulting. I just mean we're boring. Uh, I said to a group of federal uh, agency managers in Washington, D.C., you know, after listening to one of the most boring days, all good people describing all good things, but I said at the end of the day, if they were a TV show, their Nielsen ratings would be in the tank. Uh, now, part of the issue is that the science part predominates, the wonky part predominates in our discourse. You know, so you read this article, which is Science and Wonky, important article. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not down in this article. It's a great article. But that will never make it uh, for the people who are out at Walmart or people on Main Street. There has to be something else. And so what we want to do here is an experiment. Can you bring art and music and culture and science together? And oh, by the way, the food is raised organically and locally. And all the power in that block is from sunshine and efficiency. And when you flush the toilet, there is no waste product that goes into Lake Erie. And so can we begin to combine these things? You follow what I'm saying? It's a bigger dialogue. It's a dialogue about how do you harness the assets on your campus into a much bigger conversation and break out of the, the uh, kind of conceptual silo that this is all about science and policy and so forth. And it is that, but it's got to be a much bigger conversation. Um, this is the, uh, an aerial view of the block. Bob took this as he floated out of town. Uh, this is the uh, Allen Art Museum on this corner. This is going to be the driver. of uh, That's the Allen Art Museum Hall Auditorium. This is a hotel that we're intending to replace. This is a 13-acre block, and the goal here is to design this uh, to the platinum plus uh, standard at neighborhood development level or the living building challenge level but to make this block powered by sunshine, uh, zero discharge, but also the driver in the local economy. So this, uh, by the way, it's provision of food, energy, materials, artwork, and everything else uh, is, is the driver. Uh, this is the hotel. Uh, my boss, the college president, said uh, after I told an audience that this was a plausible excuse for limited nuclear war, uh, he told me never say that again. <laughs> so I don't say that again. But this is one pretty bad hotel. Built in 1955 as a motor inn, we want to replace it. And for us, in this case, that uh, involves replacing that downtown block. So everything in orange uh, is new construction. The hotel on the corner, which is right here, 
uh, for us, and just happened to be, this is the way things worked out for us. This is the hotel part, this is the conference center, this is an atrium, the four-story atrium that uh, bisects that angle. Uh, this is a street level view, these are all schematic drawings. Uh, a rear view looking back to the south, uh, this is a street view looking at it. Now, across the street uh, is the Apollo Theater, you saw that, uh, that'll be the cinematography program. Uh, the Green Arts District is all about arts, but food, th this is the driver. And for us, the way things worked out in Oberlin, and this is not a formula for any one of your campuses or for the city, this is simply the way things worked out for us. This was the way it had to evolve. This is how sustainability is going to come to Oberlin in a, in a more serious way. Uh, interior shot of the, and these again are schematic drawings. This is a project right across the street from the hotel that was started by three Oberlin students. Uh, about 10 years ago. This is a $17 million project, which is now completed. Uh, lead gold rated at the neighborhood uh, development level. Uh, commercial establishments on the first floor, 33 condominiums uh, above. Uh, this is our Senator Sherrod Brown. And I want to uh, transition here in the last few slides I've got. Steve, how am I doing time-wise? I've got five more minutes. Uh, Sherrod Brown is running for the U.S. Senate. Carl Rove has dumped about eight or nine million dollars of PAC money to beat him. Politics matter, and policy matters. Uh, right after I took this picture of Sherrod, this is on the roof of the uh, Lewis Center, uh, I, he turned to me and he said, where did you buy that array? And I said, well, our choices were you could buy it in Germany, you could buy it in Japan, now it would be China. But you couldn't buy that in the United States. And the irony was that 24 miles away is the NASA Glenn Space Center, where most of the PV technology was developed over the last 50 years. And to the east by 50 miles was the largest PV manufacturer in the United States, but they had sold all their production for the next five years to Germany where there was a feed-in tariff. Policy really does matter. Um, this is one of the farms that we started. This is a 75-acre farm outside town. We, our intention is to start or convert 35 farms. Uh, this is simply a map, which I'm not going to go into the detail. Everything in black here has been done. Uh, we so far have spent about $53 million, uh, the we meaning everybody involved in this. So, so the college, uh, private developers, the uh, public uh, institutions, and so forth. So there's a development core. This is the Green Arts Block. This is the Lewis Center you've seen, the Apollo Theater you've seen. All these are finished. We're deploying a 2.25 megawatt uh, solar array. It's a tracking array, so it'll turn out three megawatts of power. That's going in this summer. Allen Art Museum has been finished, the hotel, Green Arts District, and so forth. These are all in red, things that are uh, yet to do. So for us, uh, sustainability is really uh, dramatically about uh, economic development. Powered by sunshine, waste-free, that begins to employ local people and generate uh, a sustainable economy. These are some of the, the things that we have done so far. This is a kind of a, a quick checklist of things, but uh, the bottom line is we pulled together about $53 million. We have another roughly, oh, uh, 60 in the pipeline. And this is funded by a variety of ways. New market tax credits, uh, historic tax credits, private investment, uh, college investment, uh, every, about every way you could think of the things happen. Now, this goes back to the, one of the first things I said. In the absence of federal leadership at the local level, we're having to be real creative about money. Can you begin to save money? Can you begin like a, uh, can you begin if you can create a savings, uh, say 10 years out, can you discount that back to net present value and borrow against that sum to make things happen? We, we're gonna have to be smart about financing things. And the, the bottom line for many boards of trustees, mine included is, oh gee, we can't afford that. And the answer is you can't afford not to do it. And so virtually everything in this project will have to do. Our choice isn't whether we do it or not. The choice is whether we do it systematically and systemically as a part of this self-reinforcing system or do it as a series of one-off, overly expensive, badly integrated, and probably undoable projects. You get what I'm saying? So whether your campus or your city or whatever, we're going to have to do all these things at some point. That's just the handwriting on the wall. Um, the funding is from a variety of different sources I've already mentioned. Uh, these are some of the goals we have. The, the big one right now is going to be uh, hotel development. We hope to break ground on a hotel either late this year or early uh, in 2013. And again, the hotel is the, the big driver, the big economic uh, integrator. Um, now, let me close this out with a couple of thoughts. One is, what is this thing? Well, it depends on your perspective. So on the screen, a beam of light hits a crystal and gets refracted into different uh, bandwidths. Uh, 
from a student's perspective, it's just a cool downtown. It's a place that's vibrant. It doesn't roll up the sidewalks at 9 o'clock at night. Uh, from a faculty perspective, it's uh, better facilities. For uh, Sherrod Brown and Marcy Kaptur uh, in the House and Senate, uh, it's a model of economic development. For Bill Clinton, it was a model of climate neutrality. Uh, and then the last item on this list is about national security. So about three years ago, we began a dialogue, totally by serendipity, I won't get into the details, but uh, with a, a guy that worked the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff's office. And the long story short is, if you follow the CNA publications and the security dialogue, uh, increasing number of analysts in Washington that study security believe, rightly, I think, that security doesn't start at shores and borders and work out. It's also how you organize the electric grid, the energy system, the food system, the banking system, and so forth. So if you broaden the, uh, the definition of security, as people like uh, Jessica Tuckman Matthews suggested decades ago, you come to a, a view that security has a lot to do with sustainability. There is no unsustainable people that will be secure very long, and there's no unsustainable people that can be resilient very long. So uh, to end this, uh, looking ahead, I'll skip over that. Uh, we've got to face some things about our security that are unpleasant. There's no army big enough. There's no Star Wars shield robust enough. There's no amount of military spending. We spend about a trillion dollars in the United States on weapons and war, and it is uh, roughly about, if I, my math is correct, about 15 or $16,000 per second, and we're not more secure as a result. Um, these are uh, a couple of my uh, partners in this effort. Colonel Mark Mickleby on the left, who's now mustered out of the chairman's office, uh, Pat Doherty on the right, but we're putting together a network of similar kinds of projects at varying scales and with different sizes and so forth. It will include army bases, cities, colleges, and universities. Uh, the goal is to have one member of this network in every congressional district in the United States, whether it's a city or a corporation or a college or university or army base. Um, and then finally, um, two final thoughts. Uh, everything I've described about the Oberlin Project, everything that you do is irrelevant unless we take this to scale. And the scale ultimately has to be national and eventually global. And so if we don't meet this challenge, uh, we'll not make it. The big numbers are running against us. There's this remorseless working of big numbers. It doesn't matter whether we, we are you know, good people or not. It's just that's where the world is headed. Our goal is to put together a network at the bottom and a uh, grand strategy or a larger dialogue at the top. What do we, in, in our case of uh, people in the United States, what do we want to be when we grow up as a country? And want these to be two halves of the dialogue. So you begin to build, a, it's our version of a Tea Party movement. And take the anger and the angst and all the, the stuff that's going on in the Tea Party movement in the United States and redirect that to solarizing communities, rebuilding towns, building sustainable, resilient economies. And finally, um, uh, two last thoughts. One is in the United States, our Constitution mentions posterity only once. And the fact is that we now, all of us that use fossil fuels in large amounts, cast a long shadow on posterity. And in the case, again, of the United States, uh, that violates due process, which is the Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment to the U U.S. Constitution. It said nobody can be deprived of life and liberty and property without due process. Now, uh, oh, one last slide. This is uh, my wealth slide. The wealth of the top 400 in the United States equals that of the bottom 150 uh, uh, million, maybe it's 185 million, but that's not a way you run a, a country. Uh, last slide is this. The word sustainability is not self-defining. Uh, what, what does this mean? And there was a wonderful little book written 20 or some years ago called All I Ever Needed to Know. I learned in kindergarten, Robert Fulgham. And you think about this, and what I pulled out of the book was uh, the rules that all, we all learned. Play fair, uh, sustainability. Number two, clean up your messes. Share your cookies. Don't take things that aren't yours. And when times are dangerous, hold hands crossing streets. That's sustainability. Hey, thank you very much.
Président. No, it, it's un-American. <laughs> no, it, your, your question is really a good question. And, you, you know, I think the sustainability movement in, in the country that I've seen over the last two, three decades, we're too focused on hardware. So sustainability always has windmills and photovoltaics and green buildings. That's only the hardware. And what that, all that does is buy us some time. And then the question is time for what? And there, there you get your question is so good because it means time to understand fairness and decency and what do we owe each other and what do we owe the poorest and what do we owe future generations. That's the real part of this. Right. And so one of the things that we've done very quickly, uh, we've started, we brought in a whole series of speakers on local economies and ownership issues. Um, and the question is how do we develop a local economy that becomes a model for that kind of sustainability that is fair and decent and resilient and so forth. But uh, one, other, one other point. The um, surveys, at least in the United States, about sustainability on campuses show that the campuses are doing pretty well. Uh, so there's efficiency and there are green buildings and all that, but the curricular side of this isn't changing very much. Kids are, gra larger percentages of young people are graduating not knowing much about how the planet works as a physical system than 20 years ago. Now that's, I mean, it may be very different in Europe and Asia and so forth, and I hope it is, but in the United States, uh, we're losing ground on the mental part, the educational part of sustainability. Yeah. May I ask the second question? The second question, thanks. That, that really addresses my question. But it's, <coughs> um, the second question is on cleaning up the messes. And you, you talked about new buildings and infrastructure. And, mm -hmm. um, but what about the over, well over 90% of our building stock that's uh, yeah. well over 10 years and retrofitting? Do you have a model project there as well? You could point to and say, look, here's what over the well, uh, great, great question. And the, the built environment can't be totally replaced. We all know that. So if you have to build, build green. But if you can use adaptive, uh, if you can adapt older buildings, uh, do that. And for us, the, uh, the showcase for us was the Allen Art Museum I showed. That's a 1917 building, a really difficult thing because it's an art museum and you've got to be very careful about humidity and temperature in an art museum. The, that collection was valued at one time at $2.2 billion and you can't allow it to deteriorate. So uh, for us, uh, yeah, and, and the question is very good. And also one other uh, point on this, in the states at least, uh, energy efficiency applied to the existing stock of buildings could eliminate around 40%. Maybe it's a bit more, maybe it's a bit less, but 40% would be a pretty good guess of energy consumed in those buildings. Uh, the recent uh, showcase of the Empire State Building, uh, which eliminated, I forgot the exact number, but it was something around 30%, I believe. Somebody may know the exact number. Uh, but energy use was cut back by uh, retrofits that went into everything from uh, windows to elevators and so forth. That, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. This is true for the weatherization yeah. Mm -hmm. very so I, I wanted to ask you, uh, you uh, first of all, thanks for sobering and, uh, and inspirational. So thanks for coming. But I want to probe a little bit more about the model that you're developing at, at Oberlin for the community relationship. Given that it's a hotter and wetter environment, as you showed mm -hmm. uh, with some of the weather statistics, how has adaptation 
played in to the design issues uh, that you're talking about in uh, the uh, recasting of your community? Um, well, great question. Thanks for asking that. Uh, the, uh, the, the debate between adaptation and mitigation, for me, every place uh, where, as a grant maker, every place where those compete, I've got to mitigate. Because it, it's like having a proverbial uh, example of a bathtub and the, the faucet's turned on, and if you're simply mopping up the stuff, the water that's sloshing over the edge, you've got a problem. You've got to turn the faucet off. And so we've got to get to the point where mitigation, uh, stopping carbon emissions, is the number one priority. Uh, adaptation, uh, we're going to have to adapt to something. I mean, the Anthropocene, we are now committed to, and, and you can pick the numbers. Uh, International Energy Agency last fall had us at 2 degrees centigrade warming by mid-century. The Royal Academy the year before said that within the error bars, uh, there could be a 4 degree centigrade warming by 2061. Fact is, we don't know. And uh, we're playing, we're, we're seeing very rapid melting, if you follow the, uh, the science of the cryosphere, melting that nobody had expected is happening. This year has been particularly bad. The one slide I showed here, but been particularly bad uh, for the cryosphere. So sea level rise, which a few years ago was a few centimeters. Now it, the consensus, I think, is by the end of this century, uh, two meters sea level rise. So uh, there's a lot of adaptation. Uh, in the United States, the Midwestern part of the country will not sustain the population presently there. Uh, it'll be hotter. It'll be drier. There'll be bigger storms. Uh, it's going to be awfully hard to farm in those areas. Uh, on our hotel, we're having to look at a whole different way of thinking about uh, anchoring roof structures to foundations because we'll have F5 events uh, in Ohio. We've already had a couple uh, in the F3, 4 range. But we're going to see big storms. We're going to see lots more of them. And so how you build, how you begin to, and how you grow crops, all this. So th this is part of the dialogue, I think, that we need to have. But thanks for, yeah. thanks for that question. Maybe you've already thought about this about financing, but we put together a, a concept with a solar company about a solar renewable annuity that a alumni right. yeah. would purchase. They would own it. They could discount it. They get all the return on investment. They'd give it to the university. And we can't get our development office interested, but I hope a lot of others uh, would take this up. Well, that, that, uh, uh, thanks for mentioning it. That's a great idea. And there are lots of ways to finance things. I think the, the worst thing we can do in, in your profession and mine is to go to administrators, be told no, and then walk away. Uh, be told no if they tell you no, but then go figure out something smarter. That, that's a really good idea. Thanks for, thanks for that. So thank you so much for your talk. It's very inspiring. And, uh, I kind of want to just offer some thoughts and maybe get your thoughts about these thoughts. Um, I'm, my name is Jay, and I'm part of the Media here at the University of Oregon. And basically, uh, <coughs> we see this as a fundamental philosophic transformation and also, how like you're saying, sort of a paradigmatic shift in a sense. And, and sort of uh, wanted to offer these ideas around uh, re envisioning what the meaning of what a medium is and what media are. Um, because with, uh, sort of traditionally we see media as being these technologies and how we see these uh, ideas fit together. Uh, and in addition to that, um, what a medium is in terms of the biological science and, and where's the cross relationship between these interdisciplinary fields. So when you mentioned art, science, and humanities coming together, I really resonate with that. And, and that's actually what a lot of the work I've done here on campus is about. Um, and we're, uh, so we see this moving forward from sort of digital technologies and, and technologies in general is moving uh, forward to analog and physical and material design, sort of do-it-yourself and maker culture that's starting to emerge uh, in general and actually making things again. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Actually making things again? Yeah. You know, um, great, great question, and I'm not really competent to answer all of that. Um, uh, let me make three kind of random comments. One is the pace of technological change is so fast, and we all face this. I mean, you, you know, uh, in the past, uh, if, if you'd used the word Twitter 10 years ago, uh, no one would have known what it was. Uh, and I don't Twitter. I sometimes quiver, but I don't Twitter. But, uh, you know, the, the pace of technological change is so rapid, and we don't know where that's going. Uh, feels like synthetic biology scare me, frankly. 
uh, creating organisms for which there's no evolutionary uh, experience. Uh, and the dialogue, what, what bothers me more is the lack of dialogue about this. Uh, I'm old enough to remember a pretty robust dialogue about technology that included people like Lewis Mumford and Jacques Ayou and uh, David Ehrenfeld and uh, you know, lot, lots of folks talking about technology and what it does for us and what it does to us. And it is always a two-edged sword. And that dialogue, it seems to me, is pretty much faded out. And I think it's faded out for a reason. We are seduced by handheld devices. And I've got mine in the briefcase over here. And, you know, smartphones and, and these things that are absolutely amazing. But then we don't understand the downside of it. And there's a dialogue that we ought to have. And I don't mean to prejudge it. I'm just saying that there, there's a dialogue about, uh, about that. Secondly, um, I think we pay a price for uh, technology in this way. Rich Louvre wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods and a later book called The Nature Principle. And Rich was concerned about the fact that kids are now uh, less and less in nature. Uh, in the study of national parks, uh, it was found that most kids don't go to national parks because they're home on, you know, playing TV or video games and so forth, and they've got their own handheld devices. Uh, USA Today last year had a poll that showed kids are in front of a screen of some sort for nine hours a day, nine hours a day, and that will affect our affinity for the natural world. And so there, there is this problem of being how we connect to the natural world. And at the point where we break the psychic thread, as E.O. Wilson once put it, between humans and the natural world, that uh, biophilic thread, we are adrift. And I, that, that frightens me. That does frighten me. Thirdly, uh, on making things, uh, uh, we, somebody defined us as homo faber, you know, a uh, species that makes things. And it turns out we're not the only species that makes things. Uh, that was just arrogance. But I think it's important for us to use hands. I think it's important for us to create. And one of the things that bothers me a lot about what happens on my campus, but I see the hunger for kids that want to make things, but we don't give them much chance to do it. Uh, let me give you a third reading assignment. Alan Weissman uh, wrote a book called Gavi Otis. And Gavi Otis is a place that was either Columbia or Ecuador, and I'm kind of blanking on the, the history. It was what? Columbia, Columbia. okay. And it was a, it's, it's a great place. It was a place where you made things that solved real local problems. Now, that was a poor community. They couldn't go buy all this stuff. They just made stuff, solar collectors and things. And I see, I, I think there's a hunger to reconnect brain, both halves of the brain, and hands and heart. And if we fail to make those three connections as environmental educators and sustainability officers, uh, we'll have failed. And so much of this, uh, the dialogue about sustainability, as I said, it isn't about our hardware. It's really ultimately about our software. It's about our heart. It's about our imagination. It's about our creativity. It's about human decency. How do we, how do we build a decent society? And we're not going to do this quickly. There, there's nothing about climate change that's quick. If you look at the hard numbers, we've just bought 1,000 years of rising sea levels and rising temperatures. Uh, take a look at Susan Solomon's article in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in about uh, 2009 or the IPCC fourth report. Once carbon is in the atmosphere, it stays there a long time. So the Anthropocene isn't some little blip that we're going to go back to the Holocene. That's not the world we live in. Now, the hard part is to message that. And the hardest thing for you and me is to keep hope alive. Not wishful thinking, but hope. And I, uh, I've written a bit about this. There's a difference. If you're optimistic, you don't know enough. If you're pessimistic, that's a sin, and you don't want to go there. Hope is that sweet spot where you've got to do something. You've got to roll up your sleeves. You've got to act. If you're hopeful, you cannot be passive. You've got to be working on your campus or working in the community and so forth. Hope's just a different thing. But it, it is not the belief that, oh, we're going to win. That's optimism. Uh, there's nobody here that has good reason to say humans are going to prevail. Matter of fact, if you're at a betting parlor out in Alpha Centauri and you're looking back down there at Earth, would you bet on us? I mean, it's, it's a little bit like uh, friend David Grimes we were talking about just before uh, the talk. Uh, David Grimes is, is a river uh, guide in the Copper River up in Alaska. He used to assemble us at Riverside. Copper River is about a mile wide, big uh, glacial river. Uh, the morning devotions always ended when David Grimes would say, Lord, uh, we're a sorry bunch, but we're the best we got. That's called a human condition. And uh, with all the evil and all the fallibility and all the you know, disappointed hopes, we've got to take it to another level. And time and circumstance are not on our favor. But I think making stuff is really important. Let me take one last question here. Thanks. Uh, 
I just wanted to add uh, to your art plus science plus, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that we feel, I'm from the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in India, is that when it comes to the general population, uh, they actually really follow their own dream. And they do not have a vivid understanding of the alternate future path which uh, the scientists and experts are, are presenting. And until and unless that is made vivid, and more importantly, they, they know what will be their place in that alternate future. Uh, it will just be intellectual agreement, but they will still want their two cars, they will still want that big house. Uh, so one of the challenges that we thought, if we could create a media where there was a vivid vision of that alternate future, available through popular media, Mm -hmm. So there is more confidence and comprehension of what is that alternate development path. Yeah. So this one is a shift. No, that, that's a really good point. And I, I think the, uh, Her Honor, the mayor, uh, and Eugene, and Steve's work, and all of your work, is to make these things visible. You know, we are uh, sustainability coordinators and sustainability officers and environmental studies faculty. We have incredible power and an amazing opportunity as do architects and engineers and landscape architects, because we deal, we ought to be dealing in the visible. And that, that's where humans, you know, we, we, we come out of the, uh, the jungles, my ver version of the history is we come out of the jungles with an opposable thumb and eyesight. And so we privilege what we can see, touch, feel, experience. And if sustainability breaks out as it is on your campuses in a way that is manifest and it's visible and you don't throw it away and it's solar power and you're building green buildings, all of a sudden you've shifted the default setting. And that, that is really critically important. And as it works out, the failure at the top of our culture, the political, this is the largest political failure in human history. It's the largest you could probably ever imagine. But that has put us in education, I think, in a, an amazingly important role because it's up to us to begin to, to lead in this vacuum. And the fact is we've got campuses, we've got places to begin to show here's what sustainability is about. So thanks for that question. It's a really good point. And thanks to all of you and for all the work that you're doing. Thanks.